Hi, everyone. I'm Danielle D'Souza Gill, and I will be hosting Dinesh's podcast today. And I am so honored to be here. I've always loved um, every time I get to join. If you guys don't know me, I am Dinesh's daughter. I'm also the author of The Choice, The Abortion Divide in America, as well as Why God, An Intelligent Discussion on the Relevance of Faith. We have so much to talk about today, um, but before we get to that, make sure you follow me on social media. Make sure to find me. I'm on True Social. I'm on X, Facebook, Instagram, all the platforms. I'm at Danielle D'Souza Gill, so make sure to stay in touch with me there for um, all the latest news updates and thoughts there. But today, we are going to be talking all about J.D. Vance. We're going to be talking about um, President Trump's vice presidential pick. We are also going to be speaking to my husband, Brandon Gill. He is the Republican nominee for U.S. Congress from Texas 26. We're going to be talking about Biden's announcement to drop out of the race. We will also talk a little bit about Kamala Harris. We are also going to talk about the SAVE Act. We're going to talk about some of Joe Biden's disastrous border policies and how this is affecting kids. So stay with us. This is the Dinesh D'Souza podcast. America needs this voice. The times are crazy in a time of confusion, division, and lies. We need a brave voice of reason, understanding, and truth. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Podcast. It's been a week since Donald Trump chose J.D. Vance to be his vice presidential nominee, causing disquiet on the left and the right. Rather than choosing a candidate who would bring libertarian, never-Trumpers back into the fold or convince wealthy, college-educated voters to vote Republican, our 45th president has chosen to signal his support for a group within the Republican Party that champions policies directed at saving the middle class. J.D. Vance, along with Senators Marco Rubio, Josh Hawley, and Tom Cotton, are part of a movement within the Republican Party that seeks to address the problems of working-class Americans. On his podcast for the New York Times, the progressive journalist Ezra Klein expresses his dismay by noting that Trump's choice will help the Republicans strengthen gains made with working-class voters. Klein said that by choosing J.D. Vance as his running mate, Donald Trump has, quote, picked the vice presidential candidate who has done the most to turn Trump's impulses, his rhetoric, his political and personal brand into a coherent governing policy. The fear on the right can be summed up by the National Review's Jim Garrity, who laments that Vance's vision of the party is one he disagrees with because it promotes, quote, protectionism, populism, nationalism, industrial policy, and quasi-isolationism. Garrity concedes that Vance gave an amazing speech, but he, like others in the Republican Party, is somewhat wary of Vance's connection to the new right movement or conservatism, which seeks to restore stability and growth not just to the American economy, but to American communities as well. J.D. Vance is a great pick for vice president precisely because his vision for the future of the Republican Party is one that is fundamentally conservative. It is a vision committed to keeping our community safe, to protecting religious liberty and free speech, and most importantly, to providing a practical roadmap for making America great again. During his acceptance speech at the Republican National Convention, Vance did not shy away from highlighting points of disagreement within the party. However, rather than castigate his ideological opponents, he called on everyone to adopt an openness to change. Vance said that, quote, disagreements actually make us stronger. In his speech, he reached out with an invitation to everyone, saying, quote, my message to my fellow Americans those watching from across the country, is shouldn't be shouldn't we be governed by a party that is unafraid to debate ideas and come to the best solution? That's the Republican Party of the next four years, united in our love for this country and committed to free speech and the open exchange of ideas. The economic policy put forward by J.D. Vance in tandem with national conservatism 
owes much of its intellectual heft to Oren Cass, the chief economist and founder of American Compass, a conservative think tank that, according to its website, seeks to restore an economic consensus that emphasizes the importance of family, community, and industry to the nation's liberty and prosperity. Cass has helped draft policy proposals and goals for members of Congress, such as Marco Rubio, who has credited Cass with devising the poverty-fighting plan Rubio released in 2014. Cass has also worked closely with Vance to set Republican policy on a course that is in line with conservative values and addresses the concerns of working Americans. In Washington, D.C. this July, the National Conservatives met at NatCon 4, a conference where lawmakers discuss policy. In Cass's address, entitled Fanfare for the Common Man, he summarized the problems facing conservatives as they try to reestablish a coalition first put together by Ronald Reagan, who Cass reminds us was not a libertarian. Reagan, as Cass notes, limited free trade and offered aid packages and subsidies to help workers, most notably farmers and auto workers. In the 80s, Reagan's tariffs and quotas had conservative organizations such as the Cato Institute referring to him as the worst protectionist president since Herbert Hoover. Cass refers to Reagan's practical governance as a blueprint for how to successfully reject the libertarian conceit that government's only job is to get out of the way. Though Reagan is famous for sayings such as, quote, the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. The fact that he made that statement during a speech announcing subsidies and aid for farmers is always forgotten in the retelling. In his speech at NatCon 4, Cass notes that this libertarian impulse has infected conservatism for decades, supplanting Reagan's prudential, positive, and yes, wildly popular approach. Cass describes the situation of conservatives as follows, quote, American conservatism is at a critical moment of transition. The dogmatic market fundamentalism the naive globalism, the reckless international adventurist, its credibility, and the keepers of the orthodoxy are fading quickly from relevance, unable to defend their positions and less and less even inclined to try. National conservatism, Cass continues, has been vital to developing the critique and prosecuting the case against the old orthodoxy. But now comes the great challenge brought on by success in so many We can see the coalition of working and middle-class Americans of all colors and creeds who share our core conservative commitments. Cass concludes, We have overtaken the failed establishment and earned our right to make our pitch to the nation. J.D. Vance, as the vice presidential nominee, will make that pitch alongside Donald Trump. Vance is not only a staunch supporter of national conservatism, but he is also a passionate defender of the freedom of religion. Talking with Eric Metaxas on TBN, Vance said that conservatives must stop falling for the lie that being secular is equivalent to being neutral. He explained, if you're not allowed to say a prayer before a public school session, then you're not neutral. You're explicitly anti-Christian. Vance himself is a recent convert to Catholicism. His wife, Usha, Uh, is a Hindu, so his family itself serves an example of ways in which the United States brings together many different faiths. When Vance's wife introduced her husband at the convention, she explained that they were friends first after meeting at Yale Law School. She said, who wouldn't want to be friends with JD? He was then, as now, the most interesting person I knew. Vance does boast an impressively eclectic list of accomplishments, especially when you consider that he is only 39 years old. He was a Marine, a graduate of Yale Law School, a successful venture capitalist. He is a best-selling author of the famous book, Hillbilly Elegy, um, which was a national bestseller. He is also a U.S. Senator. He started in 2023, so um, he's very new, but obviously is extremely successful. As his wife exclaimed, his life story was made into a movie directed by Ron Howard. So that's not the case for most 39-year-olds. And of course, that was based on his book. 
What is distinctive about Vance's accomplishments, though, is that he is a true example of the American dream. Growing up in Middletown, Ohio, Vance was extremely poor, and as a result, he had a front row seat to the problems plaguing the American West. He was raised by his grandmother, Mama, because his single mother struggled with heroin addiction. This is a common experience of family life for many Americans. The difficulties that Americans have faced since the demise of the nuclear family, the loss of the manufacturing sector, has been dismissed by politicians who claim to champion workers, politicians such as Barack Obama, who famously sneered, they get better, they cling to guns or religion or antipathy to people who aren't like them, or anti-immigrant sentiment or anti-trade sentiment as a way to explain their frustrations. Funny that a progressive like Obama guy felt the need to lace his insult with plugs for the twin sacred cows of big business, namely unfettered immigration and free trade. When voters complain about the Uniparty, it's comments such as this that have drawn their ire. Wishing that manufacturing jobs had not dried up in your community, longing for a safe neighborhood, trying to defend the institution of marriage as something sacred. All of these legitimately conservative issues are too often dismissed by politicians on the right. And of course, they're dismissed by those on the left as rank bigotry. The deplorables, as Hillary Clinton dismissively referred to them, were told by the political class, are dissatisfied as the result of ignorance or bad will. J.D. Vance and the National Conservatives reject this self-serving characterizations of the majority of American citizens. During his two years in the Senate, Vance has eloquently and persuasively argued for and helped to pass legislation that makes the lives of working class citizens better without disincentivizing work. Because we definitely don't want to do that. In J.D. Vance, then, Donald Trump has offered middle America the hope that their needs will be addressed even after Trump leaves office. When you consider the fact that eight of the last 22 vice presidents went on to become a president themselves, it is entirely possible that Vance could continue to enact the MAGA platform long after Trump has concluded his second term. When Vance's New York Times number one bestseller, Hillbilly Elegy, which documents his lived experience of America's societal uh, issues, when this was published in June of 2016, it was hailed as essential reading by David Brooks, a riveting book by the Wall Street Journal, and The Economist swooned, you will not read a more important book about America this year. Thanks to his memoir and movie, it was suddenly apparent to people across the political spectrum that the American working class had been decimated by policies enacted on the right and the left, and it was long past time to start searching for solutions and listen to what they're saying. Before he was a politician, then, J.D. Vance was an advocate for the forgotten heartland. In her speech at the convention, Vance's wife Usha emphasized J.D. Vance's desire to help middle America by promoting conservative values. She said that family values Vance embraces provide the fundamental principles that guide his priorities. Her husband's goals in his new role as the vice president are the same, she said, as those he has pursued for our family. To keep people safe, to create opportunities, to build a better life, and to solve problems with an open mind. The fruit of Vance's openness to work across the aisle to get things done for working class Americans can be seen in the fact that Sean O'Brien, the president of the Teamsters, accepted Donald Trump's invitation to speak at the convention, the RNC. O'Brien was one of the best speeches. He remarked that he was the first Teamster to address the RNC in 121 years. His willingness was due, he has said in recent interviews, to the legislative support given to labor in the Senate by national conservative Republicans, such as Marco Rubio and J.D. Vance. Though Vance did not support Trump in 2016, um, we, we have seen some of those, those old quotes, Vance's literary talents brought to the fore the problems destroying middle-class families. And of course, J.D. Vance has, has since changed, changed his mind on Trump. 
Donald Trump's promises to reinvigorate the heartland by bringing manufacturing jobs back, by stopping the flow of fentanyl into our communities, and by curbing illegal, illegal immigration. These are all sincere political promises. These are all sincere political responses to the same host of evils that Vance's book details. So clearly, they're on the same page. They are united in this mission to help these people. Once again, Trump's selflessness is on display as he has chosen the running mate that is best for Americans, even though that nominee has criticized him in the past and stands as a thinker and rising political star in his own right as well. J.D. Vance was an inspired choice. He is a very bold choice. I'm looking forward to the conservative renaissance. He and um, other thinkers and politicians who fall into this line of thinking uh, will bring to American politics in the coming years. And I'm very excited for Trump Vance 2024. You might have heard Mike Lindell and MyPillow no longer have the support of their box stores or shopping channels the way they used to. They've been part of this terrible cancel culture, and so they want to pass the savings directly on to you by having a $25 extravaganza. Now, when Mike started MyPillow, it was just a one-product company, just pillows. But with the help of his dedicated employees, Mike now has hundreds of products, some of which you may not even know about. So to get the word out, I want to invite my viewers and listeners to check out their $25 extravaganza. Extravaganza two pack multi use my pillows twenty five dollars my pillow sandals twenty five dollars six pack towel sets twenty five dollars brand new four pack dish towels you guessed it twenty five dollars and for the first time ever the premium my pillows with the all new Giza fabric just twenty five dollars orders over seventy five dollars by the way get free shipping as well the amazing offer won't last long so take advantage of it call eight hundred eight seven six zero two two seven the number again eight hundred eight seven six zero two two seven oh go to mypillow.com to get the discounts to get the free shipping you got to use the promo code it's d-i-n-e-s-h dinesh these are very turbulent times i want you to start thinking about gold let me talk about oil sales of oil have historically been predominantly in u.s dollars recently oil producers like saudi arabia have been exploring options for sales in other currencies oil sales in other currencies would lessen the demand for the u.s dollar and so i ask you if there's less demand for the u.s dollar what happens to the u.s dollar not good look it's reasons like this that i buy gold from birch gold why i feel they are a valuable resource to you as well for over 20 years, Birch Gold Group has helped tens of thousands of Americans protect their savings by converting an IRA or 401k into an IRA in physical gold. To learn more, text Dinesh to 989898. Claim your free information kit on gold. There's no obligation, only information. Birch Gold has earned my trust with their education-first approach. They're thousands of happy customers. They're countless five-star reviews. So protect your savings with gold before the dollar plunges any further. Text Dinesh to 989898 today. Well, I am delighted to welcome to the podcast my husband, Brandon Gill. He is the Republican nominee for U.S. Congress in Texas 26. This is North Texas. And so, Brandon, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, how was the RNC, first of all? Unfortunately, I was not able to make it. I was here with our daughter, Marigold, who's uh, just turned one, so I felt like it was a little bit crazy um, to be taking her to the RNC at this young age, but tell us how it was there. It was great. I mean, the, the RNC, frankly, it was wild. Um, the energy was really infectious. I remember on even on one of the early days, I think it was Tuesday, I was on the floor, so I was, I was a delegate from Texas. I was on the floor and I was talking to a, a far left reporter and he was definitely not a fan of Trump or Vance or anybody else in the room for that matter. And he was saying that the energy was so infectious that whenever people were yelling Vance, 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 he almost jumped in himself and started screaming it with them. So that was the <laughs> level of not only the level of energy, but the level of unity. I mean, this is the Republican ticket that Republicans have been dying to see for decades now. I mean, I think back to the 1990, one of my favorite political speeches in recent memory is, is uh, Pat Buchanan's 1992 RNC concession speech, where he talks about going across the country and meeting with all kinds of different blue collar and working class people who have been left behind by globalism. And he says, these are the conservatives of the heart. These are the people that we need to fight for. We need to make sure that they know that we care about them. And I think that the Vance 
VP pick really solidifies now that the Republican Party is the party of the working class. It's the party that looks out for the forgotten man, the guy who's been uh, the families who have been left behind by globalism. And that's what the Republican base has been looking for. And I think that that's going to be wildly popular all across the country. But that unity is really driving an enormous amount of energy. And obviously, the Democrats can't even come close to uh, to matching that. Yeah, for sure. And I loved seeing on the first night, it was Trump sitting with Vance, sitting with Mike Johnson. You could see kind of all of the supporters of Trump behind him. And then every night when you would see different people sitting behind Trump, it was kind of like people shifting in and out who were all of his biggest supporters, all the biggest names in, in, right. in the Republican, um, you know, Congress and Senate and, and, and administration and so on. Um mm -hmm. So I, I want to now talk a little bit about Biden's announcement, of course, which is that he is not seeking re-election. I was honestly pretty shocked when I saw the news because I really thought Biden was going to stay in. I thought it was going to be Biden. I thought, um, you know, Biden has spent his entire life ever since the womb wanting to be president. Biden has been in politics his whole life. He's been senator. He's been vice president all these things, he's finally president. I just felt like he's not gonna give it up. And then Jill Biden, she's pushing him onward. Clearly he has handlers, he has people who are controlling him. And so why would he give it up? But I think the DNC, the Pelosi's, Obama, all these kind of backdoor forces eventually just coalesced. And I think they forced his hand, honestly, I don't know, but I think that they threatened him by saying, hey, if you don't step down, we're gonna ruin your legacy. But if you do step down now, we'll make sure you have a good legacy. And I don't know, I think the legacy thing with ego politicians is really big for them, especially when they're as old as Biden is. Um, so in any case, Biden releases this memo, posts it on, on, on X saying, I'm not seeking reelection. So wanted to get your initial reaction to what you thought when you saw the news of that. I think one of the most interesting things is it shows such a stark contrast between Republican and Democrat voters, because Republican voters have known for years and years and years of Biden. I mean, really, since he ran for president, we've known that he wasn't all there, that he was on the verge of dementia. He was on the verge of, of just being senile. Mm -hmm. And we could see that multiple times. Every time he goes out in public, we see the same thing. It does get progressively worse, and we've watched that, but we've seen this pattern for a while. And what's amazing is that because Democrats follow what they're told in the media so closely, they can watch the same speeches that we watch. And then afterwards, if Jake Tapper or anybody else on CNN or MSNBC tells them that what you just saw isn't actually what you saw. Don't believe your own eyes. Mm -hmm. Biden is actually all there. He's very mentally sharp. These people actually believe that. And it's not just the voter. I mean, it's the, it's the big Democrat donors mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. I think what happened was once that debate happened, it got to such a degree that they couldn't lie about it anymore. And the donors pulled out. My guess um, is what happened was is Biden went on a, a, a sort of two week dry spell where he couldn't raise any money because no donor wanted to give him any money after that debate performance. And that's what forced their hand. You saw that along with terrible polling numbers day in and day out constantly. And eventually um, the cabinet or Kamala or whoever else is pulling the strings behind the scenes just went to him and said, you cannot win. You need to step down. Um, but it's amazing how different those voters are with Republicans. I mean, Republicans, if, if, if we watched a clip of a debate or of Trump saying something or Biden saying something, nobody in the conservative media could tell us that what we just saw is not not what we saw. Right. You know, Tucker Carlson doesn't have that kind of power. Dinesh doesn't have that kind of power. Nobody does because Republican voters actually think for themselves and Democrats clearly don't. And I think that that's the that's one of the biggest, starkest contrasts between the two. Or they don't allow them to think they don't for allow themselves because them. they're they're the, the, the puppet masters. Um, what do you think about this idea, though, that if Biden is saying, hey, I, I can't run for election, I mean, he didn't actually... He didn't actually say, hey, I'm so mentally declined, I can't run. But he also didn't say, uh, I'm polling so badly, so I can't run, because all of those things would be kind of embarrassing. Um, but it does beg the question, well, 
why aren't you resigning? Why aren't you stepping down? If if we all saw your debate performance, we all see that you're falling down the stairs, you're unable to conduct business after 4 p.m. and you're you're in bed, you're 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 clearly incapable. So Brandon, when Biden put out this letter, he didn't say why he was dropping out. He didn't say, hey, I'm on mental decline. I, I can't serve anymore, so I'm not running. He didn't say, oh, my polling numbers are so bad and that's why I'm not running. But it does beg the question when you see the debate performance, like you mentioned, you see him stumbling down the stairs, you see that he can't conduct business after 4 p.m. You see all these things about Biden, it does make you wonder if you can't run for re-election, how can you continue as president? So what do you think? Well, that's exactly right. And what's amazing is Biden on Sunday makes the biggest announcement of his political career. Then the following day, Monday, he doesn't do a single public uh, performance. He does. He doesn't do anything in public. I mean, the guy is completely behind the scenes, nowhere to be seen. But you're exactly right. If you can't run for president, you shouldn't be president. And the reason that he's not running for president isn't because people are concerned about what his mental state is going to be three months or six months or two years from now. It's his mental state right now. It's the fact that he can't even get through a debate with President Trump without sounding incoherent and blabbering for the majority of the time. So this is incredibly dangerous. You know, we hear we hear people talking about, you know, President Biden having the nuclear codes or what do our foreign adversaries think about this? And that's a real that actually is a real, really big threat right now. Yeah. I mean, Biden, everybody can see that Biden isn't there and he should step down. He should resign. And if he won't, then the cabinet needs to step in and invoke the 25th Amendment and Congress needs to pass it. And we need to get him out of there. Yeah. And I think we should push for it, even if it doesn't happen because we don't have a supermajority. We need to push for it just because of the, the, the fact that this man is the president right now. Joe Biden is the president. And that's extremely concerning. Um, I also think Kamala Harris is complicit in this. Kamala Harris has been covering for him for years, months. She, even after the debate, was acting like, oh, you know, Joe Biden was great. It was fine. Or he had a cold. I mean, she's been covering for him for the last couple of weeks, which has clearly been an act because that whole time mm -hmm. she was probably gearing up herself to to run for president and is clearly happy to, to, to step in and run now, even though she was defending him a couple minutes ago. Do you think that Republicans calling out Kamala Harris's complicitness in a his administration his disastrous policies biden's just biden's policies as well as covering for biden's mental decline would be kind of two of our main focuses now moving forward with the campaign well i think just the fact that she lied to the american people for so long and so flagrantly as vice president that itself disqualifies her from being president i mean that should put such a sour taste in the mouth of any voter who's looking at this election, that she would be that flagrant, that flagrantly dishonest. Um, but I mean, listen, she's one of the most dislikable Democrat politicians there is. I mean, it, it's funny. It's the question is, could the Democrats find somebody who's more disliked than Hillary Clinton? And they probably did with Kamala Harris. You know, she remember she was the uh, a Democrat prosecutor. She made her career by going after drug crimes. And you can say what you will about whether those are good or bad. But she locked up a lot of people over drug crimes and then turned around and goes on media appearances and brags about listening to rap music and smoking weed while she was in college. I mean, the level of just disingenuous hypocrisy. She lied about the rap music, by the way, because uh, she went on uh, The Breakfast Club and talked about how she would listen to Tupac when she was in, in college in the 80s. Tupac didn't make music in the 80s. So this, she was in college prior to him. So the, the level of disingenuousness is, is staggering with her. Um, and of course, she's been the border czar for the past two or three years. And look how that's done. She's been calling for Ukraine to join NATO, which is one of the absolute most irresponsible foreign policy decisions, in, in my in my opinion, um, that you could make right now. So she would be such a terrible disaster and everybody can see it. Um, but, you know, and I, I think we should call her out on it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, the entire campaign has clearly changed now that 
now that Harris is, is at the top of the ticket, who knows who she's going to choose as her vice presidential um, running mate. So a lot is a lot has changed. I mean, the last couple of weeks in American politics has been crazy. Um, so we're going to keep staying on top of all the news and everything happening. Well, Brandon, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's happening right before our eyes. America is at the end stages of a Marxist revolution. The new documentary, Beneath Sheep's Clothing, is a stark commentary on the communist infiltration of American culture, pushing a Marxist ideology in our colleges, our churches, and media. Beneath Sheep's Clothing exposes the dark truth about the communist playbook to overthrow America without firing a shot. We're told we'll be liberated from oppression, but instead it takes away our freedoms to impoverish and enslave us, to subvert and control our culture and government until we're just another Soviet communist state. The next step is a political revolution unless we the people wake up and reclaim our American values and freedoms. Don't miss the shocking documentary Beneath Sheep's Clothing. Get the strategies and solutions to stop this before it's too late. Watch Beneath Sheep's Clothing. See the trailer now at SalemNow.com. It's SalemNow.com. The movie is Beneath Sheep's Clothing, and you can see the trailer at SalemNow.com. Are you feeling overwhelmed by the increasing cost of health insurance? Have you had enough of not having control over your healthcare dollars? Introducing ShareRight, Share, R-I-G-H-T, healthcare done the right way. At ShareRight, you're not just a number, you're part of a caring community. Forget about paying excessive premiums. With ShareRight, you stand to save 30 to 50% compared to health insurance. So think about what you could do with all those savings. But it's more than just savings. ShareRight ensures you have access to the care you deserve precisely when you need it, from routine checkups to unexpected emergencies. With ShareRight, your health care is their priority. So empower yourself today by taking control of your health care costs. Visit joinsharerightorg slash Dinesh to learn more. See how much you can save. Join sharerightorg slash Dinesh. That's where you go. Again, it's joinsharerightorg slash Dinesh for health care done the right way. In April of 2021, President Biden announced that American forces would begin withdrawing from Afghanistan in May so that all U.S. troops would be out of the country by the 20th anniversary of 9-11. The ensuing withdrawal from Afghanistan is a historic low point for the American military. Botched and chaotic, the poorly organized exit left behind $7.2 billion worth of high-tech military equipment, our Afghan allies who put their lives on the line to assist Americans and commit to the hard job of building a democracy in their country, and our brave service members. The Taliban retook Kabul on August 15, 2021, and now rules with the same ineffective policies based on strict adherence to a narrow interpretation of Sharia law. According to the World Bank, Quote, after a severe 20.7% GDP contraction in 2021, the Afghan economy contracted further by 6.2% in 2022 as a direct result of the U.S. withdrawal and the subsequent collapse of the democratic government in Afghanistan. Women are no longer allowed to attend high school or university. Food shortages are common as the government focuses on adhering to um, their interpretation of religious law rather than statecraft. So it always is with all ideologues who rise to power. Our withdrawal from the disastrous consequences that result from the Biden administration's commitment to governing through symbolic gestures meant to signal the implementation of a woke agenda. Another catastrophic failure, driven by ideological principles rather than common sense, is the administration's decision to aid and accelerate illegal immigration. Just as this shameful withdrawal from Afghanistan shocked and dismayed the world, the Biden administration, commit their commitment to keeping the border open, infuriates Americans. According to a Pew Research poll conducted in January of 2024, 78% of Americans believe the large number of migrants seeking to enter the United States at the U.S.-Mexico border is a major problem. 
after a slew of polls came out in January and February, voters' dissatisfaction became so apparent that even mainstream media outlets such as CBS began reporting on it. In January, CBS warned that the percentage of Americans who think the Biden administration, quote, should be tougher on immigrants trying to cross, it is up to the highest percentage yet. Approval ratings for Biden's handling of the U.S.-Mexico border has also dropped, and CBS reported his approval on handling immigration in general was at an all-time low. His poll numbers on this issue continue to drop. In the winter of 2024, even support for transporting migrants to northern sanctuary cities had dropped among not only Republicans, but also Democrats, with polls showing that most Americans disapprove of that practice. Yeah, because a lot of liberals live in cities like uh, Martha's Vineyard when DeSantis famously uh, sent the illegals up there. They didn't like that so much. So... No no surprise, Democrats are not too happy with this policy either. So why do Democrats persist in supporting policies that are unpopular with their own group, as well as with everyone, even when they hurt Americans? Their party platform is festooned with meaningless identity politics, bizarre sexual fetishes, and yes, a commitment to an open border. Real issues like rising crime, the safety of our children, the tanking economy, or out-of-control inflation never seem to resonate with party leadership. That's because our issues don't have to resonate with them. Democrats learned long ago that personnel is policy. That applies to the electorate as much as it applies to their million-dollar businesses. Their group is run basically by a DNC by a machine, a political machine, who, who chooses their, their candidates. As Republicans, we operate based more on the voter. Why bother trying to win over hearts and minds to your mentality when you can just add your own hearts and minds? That's the real story behind the border crisis. Democrats are actively endangering you and your family because they know their policies, which gain them power and wealth and more voters, these, you know, oftentimes illegal immigrants, illegal voters coming in, at the expense of our citizenry, they are unappealing and morally bankrupt for voters, but they still jam it through. This is why you won't see Democrats vote for the SAVE Act, which requires states to receive proof of citizenship when registering to vote, either by mail or at a government office. Speaker Mike Johnson explains that the SAVE Act has been and drafted in response to Democrats who have expressed a desire to turn non-citizens into voters. As Speaker Johnson notes, transforming non-citizens into voters is what Joe Biden's open border is all about. Recent polls support Speaker Johnson's opinion, so he is right when he claims that, quote, Americans are deeply concerned about this. No matter if you are in a blue state or a red state, everyone is concerned. Now, Democrats, again, they're run by the DNC, they're run by a big powerhouse, Nancy Pelosi, Obama, all of these influences, and they don't really care what voters think on this issue. They just care that if they bring in these these illegals, if they can get these votes, that will help them in the end. Therefore, the ends justify the means. And Republicans, we, on the other hand, we tend to look at the polls. We tend to look at what voters think and say, hmm, you know, this seems to be a serious issue. If Republican primary voters are saying, hey, you know, maybe we shouldn't have Democrats voting in these primaries. Maybe we should close our border, not just for safety reasons, but also because, hey, we don't know if these people are going to find a way to to vote in our elections illegally. Um, that's that's a problem. And I think most Republicans, we want to clean up our elections. We don't want to have, you know, shadiness going on at the at the polls and and we don't we don't we don't want anything to subvert the process. We we want to do paper ballots. We want all of this. Now, considering the situation that we're in, though, we look at the Democrats and see not only is that not a priority for them, this situation of chaos actually helps them. So, um the Democrats up top, they love this situation, but Democratic voters actually not so much because a lot of the times these illegals are actually wreaking havoc on their communities too. Um, 
So yeah, most, most people are actually very concerned about, about the open border. The Safeguard American Voter Eligibility Act puts procedures in place to ensure that only Americans are voting. As the bill's sponsor, Representative Chip Roy, says, this is about the rule of law, ensuring the integrity of elections, the simple proposition that only citizens should vote. What a concept. Although it is illegal for non-citizens to vote, a practice began in 1993 with the passage of the National Voter Registration Act, which has made it easy for non-citizens to register. The NVRA, commonly referred to as the Motor Voter Bill, requires states to provide voter registration materials and assistance to those getting a driver's license, state identification, welfare benefits, and so on. So, there are no checks in place to make sure that non-citizens do not receive voter registration materials. Add to the fact that in March of 2024, the foreign-born population reached 51.6 million, 5.1 million more than in March of 2022. That is the largest two-year increase ever recorded in American history, the Center for Immigration Studies reported in May. The center estimates that nearly 58% of the increase during the Biden administration is due to illegal immigration. Americans support immigration but not the chaotic and dangerous open border crisis that the Biden administration has created at our southern border. Historian Victor Davis Hansen writes that, quote, polls continue to show that the American people support measured, diverse, legal, and meritocratic immigration as much as they oppose mass illegal immigration into their country and the subsequent loss of American sovereignty on the border. No matter how many elite Democrats call us racist bigots for opposing the um, erasure of our southern border, the fact remains that American sovereignty must be protected, not just for our own citizens, but for the millions of people across the world who seek freedom and prosperity by migrating to the United States and want to come here legally. Hansen is not only a renowned historian and classicist, but also a fifth-generation farmer in Selma, California, so he has experienced firsthand the deterioration of living conditions for those in communities like his, which have been impacted by the border crisis. Hansen writes that the elite bottled piety the Democrats engage in ignores the abject catastrophe that is the current state of our southern border and the cities in our southwest. He adds that no nation in history has survived once its borders were destroyed, once its citizenship was rendered no different from mere residence, and once its neighbors with impunity undermined its sovereignty. The SAVE Act seeks to ensure that American sovereignty survives. Last week, the New York Post reported that in 49 U.S. states, welfare offices and other agencies from Health and Human Services to the DVM provide voter registration forms to migrants without requiring a proof of citizenship. Arizona is the only state that has banned the practice of giving applicants for either welfare benefits, driver's license, or even mail-in ballots voter registration forms without demanding proof of citizenship. And for that, Democrats have taken the state to court. A bench trial in 2023 saw Democrat Party-funded experts testifying about voting discrimination in Arizona. They claimed that Native American and Latino voters were kept from voting in the 1970s and the 1980s, and that requiring proof of citizenship or purging the voting rolls of ineligible voters is a return to racist practices. However, despite Democrats' best attempts to keep Arizona from protecting its citizens from voter fraud, in February, a federal judge upheld the legality of most of the new provisions in Arizona law. In her ruling, she wrote, Considering the evidence as a whole, the court concludes that Arizona's interests in preventing non-citizens from voting and promoting public confidence in Arizona's elections outweighs the limited burden voters might encounter when required to provide proof of citizenship. The casual brutality that results from the administration's brazenly political decisions destroys lives. Whether it is on the plains of Kandahar in Afghanistan, 
or in rural farming communities of Southern California, families and their once thriving communities are paying the price enacted by Biden and Harris's administration's policies. In his farewell address from office, Ronald Reagan said that we've got to do better. We've got to do a better job of getting across that America is freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of enterprise, and freedom is special and rare. It's fragile. It needs protection. Despite what the mainstream media says about the SAVE Act being racist or exclusionary or a dastardly Republican plot to keep people from voting, it is in fact an attempt to preserve our freedoms and our American way of life, not just for Americans, but for legal immigrants wanting to come to this country. KIND is an advocacy group whose name stands for Kids in Need of Defense. Founded by Microsoft and UN Refugee Agency Special Envoy and actress Angelina Jolie, the group claims to protect children, specifically immigrant children. But in actuality, this unholy alliance between Silicon Valley, Hollywood, and the United Nations supports policies that actually hurt children. Kind's actual work seems to be partnering with corporations, attorneys, and law schools to shepherd immigrant children through the complicated legal process they are subjected to once they've illegally entered our country through the southern border. These children, many unaccompanied minors, need kind services in part because there's been an astronomical increase in their number since Joe Biden and Kamala Harris's administration took over U.S. immigration policies, leaving these kids in a very vulnerable position. The Biden and Harris administration has enacted a number of changes, beginning with the removal of the wonderful Trump era policy that kept minors from being shepherded across the border by adults. This policy was put in place in order to curb human trafficking. Though criticized by the left, the policy did what DC politicos claimed to want. It protected children in danger of being trafficked. In 2019, Customs and Border Control Chief Carlo Provost criticized the earlier Obama policy of catch and release, noting how it facilitated the business of smuggling people into the country. She said, quote, smuggling organizations tried to exploit catch and release to use children as a commodity, she warned. The Trump administration understood that the earlier Obama era policy actually incentivized child trafficking. By ending catch and release, Trump's policies ensured this form of exploitation was less lucrative, while also simultaneously lowering border crossings overall. So, big win. But when Biden and Harris restarted their version of catch and release, Biden and Harris couldn't naively claim that resurrecting the child human trafficking industry was an unintended consequence. No. As Obama's VP, Biden was well aware of how this policy change had played out, to the extent that Biden is aware of anything. But even now, the tragic impact of Biden's disastrous immigration policies are being ignored by his administration. Now, Kamala Harris, she is no better. She was supposedly his border czar, did an awful job. Now, Biden and Harris have exempted minors from deportations while mandating that children must never be separated from their families. But this has turned children into meal tickets that ensure an indefinite stay in the United States and a steady revenue stream. Not surprisingly, an ongoing host of atrocities is the result, one of which being the renting of children to groups of illegal immigrants seeking entry to our country, using them as shields. Shockingly, Biden and Harris have not stopped there. According to a June 2023 America First Policy Institute brief on child exploitation at the southern border, the Biden administration is no longer bothering to vet those who volunteer to house and care for unaccompanied minors. This carelessness has led to the government losing contact with as many as one third of these unaccompanied minors. They've disappeared. What's more, Immigrant, tr immigrant children exist in a state of legal limbo. Despite being too young to work in the states and despite lacking proper paperwork permits, unscrupulous sponsors, the aforementioned caretakers of these unaccompanied minors, 
are forcing children not just into illegal activities such as prostitution, but also licit employment, such as factory work. The children work and the sponsors collect their pay. In meatpacking plants, children younger than 13 have been put to work cleaning dangerous machinery, the names of which paint a grim picture of the children's toil, cleaning and maintaining skull splitters, brisket saws, and bone cutters. Children are working in meatpacking factories across eight states, according to the U.S. Department of Labor. Accidents leading to amputations have been on the rise in recent years as the use of child labor in the U.S. has skyrocketed. The Office of Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, has reported. Um, so this is very bad. Parent companies of such meat production facilities, such as the investment brokerage group Blackstone Group, simply pay the penalties the government levies whenever their companies are caught illegally using underage workers. No real change occurs, and the maiming and abuse of child workers continues apace. Wow. The America First Policy Institute reports that, quote, America is experiencing a revival of the worst parts of the Industrial Revolution and indentured servitude. As bleak as that sounds, that's one of the better fates for children who survive the dangerous trip through the southern border. Many of the others are forced into sex trafficking. Many suffer horrible fates at the hands of traffickers, and many don't make it at all. But such stories do nothing to prick the conscience of leftists like Biden or leftists like Harris. Harris, who was supposed to be in charge of the southern border or the kind group. They seem to believe that as long as they ignore the consequences of their actions, they don't have to take responsibility for them. Two immigrants who wish the regime would permit their children to remain in their custody are Uwe and Hanalor Ramiki. According to a 2023 Washington Examiner story, the Biden and Harris administration is trying to deport the couple. They originally sought asylum here 15 years ago because they ran afoul of the German government for the crime of being Christian homeschoolers. In terms of immigration policy, this seems something of a contradiction for Biden and Harris. But in terms of the left's views on children, it's completely consistent. According to socialist leftist dogma, no one is more suited to take care of your children than the state. Pro-liberty beliefs like Christianity and homeschooling are thus threats to statist utopia schemes. The left has no problem with the UN and Angelina Jolie stepping in as child advocates, but actual parents fleeing political oppression are not welcome. Here again, leftists who oppose homeschooling do so despite the harm their policies cause. On average, homeschooling students perform 15 to 25 percent above their public school counterparts on standardized tests, according to the National Home Education Research Institution. In addition, homeschooling has widespread appeal, with 41 percent of homeschooled students being non-white minorities. But with leftists, it's not about what's best for the next generation. It's not about performing well. It's about control. Leftists want children to be shackled to their preferred institutions where they control the indoctrination, even if it means turning the United States into a Dickensian hellscape. A disturbing pattern is emerging here. At one time, leftists were infamous for using government bureaucracy to break systems and plead for millions in tax dollars in order to fix the problems they had created. Now it seems their avarice has expanded beyond mere greed and into our future through the control of the next generation. That control has nothing to do with concern, care, or kindness. It unfailingly manifests itself as some form of captivity or slavery. And if that's how they intend to treat people at the start of life, one can only shudder at the idea of what they have in store for them in later years. Well, that wraps up today's show. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to follow me on social media. I am at Danielle D'Souza Gill. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, X, True Social, all the places. And I would love to see you guys there. That's where you can find me. I will see you all tomorrow and MAGA. 
Subscribe to the Dinesh D'Souza podcast on Apple, Google, and Spotify. Or watch on Rumble, YouTube, and SalemNow.com.